Good afternoon, everyone. It's a little loud. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Sharon Squassoni. I direct the Proliferation Prevention Program <clears throat> here at CSIS. And um, I was describing to my boss, this is my uh, uranium plutonium week. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about uranium today uh, with Cindy Vestergaard and uh, plutonium later in the week as we uh, explore Japan, uh, what Japan is doing. But we are webcasting. Uh, so I would particularly ask you to turn your cell phone ringers off. Um, and uh, we're gonna go through, I'm gonna give a, a short presentation on the US part of this project on governing uranium. And then um, Cindy will give her presentation. That's exactly what I was referring to, that cell phone ring. Unless you have a really cool cell phone ring. Then that's, um, and then we'll uh, open the floor to questions. And I ask that when you ask a question, just identify yourself so that everyone knows. This is totally on the record, correct? Um, and so it's my great pleasure um, to bring back for an encore. Uh, Cindy Vestergaard, she was here last year uh, as a visiting fellow and um, she brings a tremendous amount of expertise and enthusiasm, and she's just really plainly a lot of fun to work with. Uh, but Cindy um, is a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Affairs. And she was formerly with uh, the Canadian um, Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Um, and has done a lot of work on chemical weapons, among other things, uh, and nuclear stuff. Um, Cindy was here and uh, in connection with a project funded uh, in part by the MacArthur Foundation. I think there's some other funders involved, but on <clears throat> it's a global project on governing uranium. And um, CSIS was privileged to be a part of that project. We published a report um, that is available on our website. Um, so you choose, you can download the PDF for free or you can pay for a version <laughs> published by Rowan and Littlefield. It, that's also, um, you can look up the details on our website if you want you know, a physical copy that looks really nice. Um, <clears throat> I am going to brief, and I'm gonna try and be as, as quick as I can because um, I'm much more interested in the international implications of this, but I'm gonna brief on the US portion of our project um, and then Cindy will talk about the international um, <clears throat> research that's been ongoing uh, and give a little more background about the project. So I'm gonna get started. I have some slides. I'm gonna stand up. Um, I hope I can make all of this work at the same time. We're gonna switch mics. Does that work? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> So this is actually a briefing uh, that uh, I gave in Copenhagen. some of these, but anyway, uh, we'll give a little background. Why were we even involved in this project? Um, there hasn't been too much attention to the front end of the fuel cycle, and what we're, we're uh, looking at here is really uranium mining, milling, and conversion. Um, in the non-proliferation world, for a lot of reasons. One, we have a lot of controls further down the product chain where the material is more attractive. But the IAEA is actually in the process of defining what these prudent management practices would be for uranium security. And I'll say right off the bat, which is why I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time today on this, 
the U.S. is not the bi biggest risk here <laughs> when you're looking globally. And why? Well, because we're a leader in nonproliferation and nuclear security. Uh, but also, if you were to look at the risks of different kinds of material in the U.S., you're, you're not going to worry about the uranium in the mines, right? We have a lot of other material that is um, at higher risk. But having said that, we have a lot of experience across the board. We've produced uranium, we've consumed it, we export it, we import it. And so maybe there are some lessons learned in the way in which we've governed uranium for other countries. The newcomers, Malawi, uh, eventually Greenland, um, like those. So <clears throat> I'm going to highlight where the U.S. experience may be unique, in which it's not applicable for other countries, talk a little bit about some recommendations for improved governance, and then um, bring together in this group, and I see we have some uh, people from industry, government, and other experts to sort of engage in a discussion on this area. Okay, so <clears throat> this is just some history. This is the context part. We're going to really breeze through this. Um, <clears throat> and this is my attempt to be flippant, I guess. Um, you know, the, when you go back to uranium, uh, you know, pre-war years, 20s, 30s, or, or even before, I would say we were relatively ignorant. You know, what is this material? Um, you know, it was generally a byproduct of, um, of other things we were producing. And let me um, just stop here for a moment and uh, recognize a couple of people in the room who did an enormous amount of work on this project. Number one is Stephanie Cook, who's sitting in the back. And then Bobby Kim, and I don't know, if, and Jake Greenberg, also in the back. Uh, they did a lot of heavy lifting on the research and writing. Um, so that phase lasted up until about 1939. And suddenly we discovered, well, uranium <clears throat> has a strategic value. And so we placed, we had positive controls on it. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission had a lot of incentives, actually, for production of uranium, and we had a uranium rush. But there was a, a lot of the um, controls in, not never in the mines, but uh, particularly in um, some phases right um, after the mine in uh, milling and enrichment, obviously. Um, then we moved through a kind of laissez-faire uh, phase. Uh, where the, we actually opened our market to foreign uranium. And then, of course, from the 80s, we, 80 to, 82 to 92, a, a slump, and then probably about a steady state from 92, although I think, our, as you'll see when we go through the data, we've had a real drop in uranium production in the US. So um, just to give you a sense, this is where our uranium is in the West. Um, sorry if that's not totally clear on the slides, it is in the report. And this will show you the darker the color, the more dense uh, the mines are. So you can see it's really kind of focused in the, the uh, western third of our country. Uh, uranium prices, this, this particular graph goes just to 2000. I'll show you. We have an update to that. But you can see you had a, a peak or a surge. Um, and then it's gradually coming down. A lot of the, you know, that, that's a combination of, you know, domestic um, and some imported uranium there. And then you can see price spike uh, in the spot price uh, more recently, and then the numbers are coming down. I think, you know, I know Melissa is in the audience, so she can probably, if you have specific questions about um, nodes in these uh, graphs. I'm sure she can answer that. Um, this is, you can see the blue line is purchased imports against domestic production. You can see they're at opposite ends, right? So in other words, you know, we were trying uh, to, to boost up our uranium production, and so we banned foreign imports. And then that switches, and you can see that in 19, <clears throat> in the early 90s, we had uh, the megatons to mega, megawatts program, and so we're importing a lot of um, uh, HEU actually to blend down. Uh, this is actually, 
domestic production imports of uranium concentrate. All right, and then this is just to give you a sense, this is our ore production. So production dropping off in the 80s, now it's kind of at a steady state. Um, and the difference, you know, the, there is a difference in the technologies that have been using. So now we're getting a lot less uranium from the mines and more from um, the, um, in si uh, what is it, the concentrates? Re Bobby, help me out here. In situ leaching. Um, this is our purchases, just in case you thought um, that nuclear energy is a, sort of path to energy independence. <laughs> this very colorful graph shows where we're getting our uranium from, a whole lot of different countries. Um, and you can see that, you know, that includes Russia, Australia, Canada, obviously, Kazakhstan, the big, some of those big producers. This orange part at the bottom is US um, production. All right, and then again, you can see operating mines. Some of these are, you know, be, because the numbers are small, the, some of this, you see a big drop off, but, but we've only had a few mines. But, um, and they're differentiated between underground open pit and these in situ leaching sites. And then again, operating conventional mills. We have, is it one or two mills that we have open now? One. All right, so basically the picture in the U.S. is we had, a lot of, we had a lot of incentives from the government to build up our production in the early years. It's fallen off. We are now no longer a big producer of, of uh, uranium. We've got six conventional mines operating, just one mill, just one conversion plant, uh, Converdine. Um, most of our exports are, you have six uh, for that we're exporting to get converted at Urenco and Eurodif, and then we um, uh, export some yellow cake to Canada and France for conversion, the 308. So what is industry? What, what motivations do they have to do their material accounting and control? Um, obviously, they want to comply with regulations. Uh, but mostly economics. So at the mine, um, you know, you want good recovery rates. At the, at the converter, you're gonna do this for bookkeeping. You know, you, you wanna keep decent books. And then, then transportation, if you're transporting um, this material, you know, one truck worth can sometimes equal $2 million worth of material. So you're gonna keep track of this. And basically, the history of uranium governance in the US has been mostly focused on, well, these guys have an economic reason to, you know, make sure that it's physically secure and to account for it. That um, has been, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure I would say compounded, but we have a particular system in the United States with the agreement states where states have a particular sovereignty um, that kind of compounds this. The NRC, if you didn't know this, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does not regulate mines. Um, that is kind of a historical, I mean, the reason is because of the, um, what is the, <laughs> sorry, no, 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 it's, it's the, the mining law back in uh, 1872 uh, Mining Act, but also with this, agreement states uh, approach. So the NRC is regulating uranium processing, so it will regulate the, these in situ leaching and the mills and the conversion. So what you wind up with is that there are actually no physical protection requirements at mines. There are some um, requirements for transportation, but by and large what we found is that the Department of Transportation regulations are mostly tied to safety rather than physical protection. Um, and then from 1978, we had the landmark uh, UMTRICA, the Uranium Mine Tailings Recovery God, Something Act, C. What did C stand for? UMTRICA, which control <laughs> act. Thank you. Um, whose basic focus was on environmental health 
and safety. So again, not on security, but there are some spillover effects for security. Um, and then finally, there are some reporting requirements for imports and exports, but it's a little bit murky when you get back down to the details in terms of investigating violations. All right, so here's just a, a chart that will show you the different elements of the front end um, that we looked at, conventional mining, ISL mining, milling, conversion, transportation, and then the material that's coming in and out of the country, what the legal requirements are, the different products that are associated with it, so ore from conventional mines, uranium concentrate from the ISL and milling, uh, UF6 when it comes out of conversion, and then here are the lead agencies and the measures that are associated with them. Uh, and you can see at mining and milling primarily for safety and environmental reasons. Um, does any of this matter? <laughs> because often when you talk to industry, they're like, ah, oh, well, this, you know, this is not a big deal. And in, and in nuclear nonproliferation, um, it's certainly not the, the area in which we spend the most amount of attention, but it's gaining more attention. And so we set about thinking about risks. How do you think about the risks? And so the International Atomic Energy Agency, you know, we in nuclear non-pro, we all know what a significant quantity is, right? When we're talking about highly enriched uranium or plutonium. But there's also a significant quantity in terms of natural uranium, and that is 10 tons of natural uranium. Okay, but so what does that mean in terms of ore? You need a lot of ore to come up with 10 tons of natural uranium. The devil is in the details, though. So the question is, at what percentage, how good is your ore, right? How rich is it in uranium? At their best, U.S. mines, at their best, were 1% grade, right? So that equals into 1,000 tons of ore. So in order to get one significant quantity of natural uranium, which we'll see eventually you know, through all the processing can yield, if you go up all the way up, could yield as much as 45 kilograms of HEU, but you gotta, you gotta take 1,000 tons of uranium ore. Other places in the world have higher grade ore. So when you're looking at pitch blend or you know, in, in Kazakhstan or Canada, then you're saying, well, you'd have to steal a lot less ore um, to get to that natural quantity. When you're looking at, for example, this, um, the second category, 0.086% grade, uh, then you're looking at 11,000 tons that you're gonna have to steal. And then, of course, as you move further up the chain into yellow cake and UF6, the, the quantities become smaller and smaller. Okay, so you're gonna ask me next, uh, why does that matter? <laughs> All right. I mean, the answer is how much do you have to steal or would, would you need in the United States because the uranium is not such, um, is, uh, not such a high grade, you'd have to steal a lot. Okay, so uh, if you ha got that 10 tons of natural uranium, how much HEU or plutonium could you produce? Okay, again, the devils are in the details. Everybody knows about enrichment, tails assay. This um, would have to have a 0.3 tails assay uh, to get up to 45 kilograms of HEU. And if you're looking to go towards plutonium, then um, you could, with 10 tons of natural uranium, if you go through the entire process, yield 10 kilograms of plutonium. All right, so not a terribly huge risk in the United States, but we started to think, okay, so where are the gaps in all of this? So these are the different, um, different points in the process that we looked at. So how secure are the ore stockpiles at the mining site, in transit to milling, at the milling sites, and route to conversion, all of these things. So we came up with this kind of rough table, which is divided. Um, into two categories. How attractive is the material and what's the risk of detection if it were diverted or stolen? 
So, one thing I want you to notice on the left hand, so under theft diversion or export control falsification, you know, how attractive are ore stockpiles at the mines? We couldn't even really put low, we just said lowest. <laughs> you know, to, in order to be motivated to steal ore at a mine, um, you know, that material is really very unattractive uh, for, you know, anybody seeking to, to divert it for nefarious purposes. Um, at the same time, the risk of detection, here we are up under the theft category, the risk of detection is low, relatively low. So when you come away with this, you're sort of like, well, the less attractive it is, you know, do you care so much if the risk of detection is low? Probably not so much. But when you get to sort of the yellow cake at Mills, for example, in a case of diversion, where the material is eh, not so attractive, but there's only a medium chance of the risk of detection. I'm going to go into an actual case <laughs> in the United States. But there are other cases overseas where some people kind of took advantage of the opportunity. So you shouldn't totally ignore this. I mean, you, there, there, there needs to be some attention to it. And I will say that this asterisk thing where it says medium, it's medium now, but at the time at the case, that this case happened back in 1979, I would say that it was low. And that is that the, that the risk of detection was low. Um, so this is a, an excerpt from an article uh, from the Roswell Daily Record um, from April 10th, 1979, where you can see that 5,000 pounds, not a, a terrific amount, of uranium was stolen from Sahayo's mill. And it was recovered in a kind of, I think it was sort of a sting operation. Um, but this is what these guys testified, that they simply loaded barrels of uranium into a company pickup truck on three occasions and drove it out of the plant. And they said, well, the easiest part was getting it out of the plant. And that's because <laughs> You know, the way they take inventory down there, it would never be missed, right? So what happened in this case is that if a barrel wasn't full, um, it wasn't a full barrel and it wasn't accounted for. And I think this was also the case of what happened in Kazakhstan when material was um, being diverted, not with official plant um, uh, knowledge, but by some enterprising staff who were going to make some extra money. And I, I can't remember where that material actually went to Iran or it was destined uh, or that, that was the intended destination. So since this incident, um, the accounting measures have been improved, I believe. Um, so what does this tell us? You might think about a few governance objectives. You could have more transparency at the mines, at the mills, at the converters. Uh, you could have more follow-up um, on reporting, on thefts. Uh, you could have more monitoring of uranium movements. Um, and the question is, if better security of uranium, if we agree that we need better security of uranium, could you kind of somehow wrap this up into a state-level approach by the IAEA? And then the questions that I put on the table for us today, uh, although I would like to, you know, actually in the international context, um, focus on this. Does industry have incentives to do more, uh, either in production or transportation? And if they don't, are there incentives that we can create for them? Um, can we better leverage safety regulations for security purposes? Are there additional cost-effective measures? I mean, and that's really a critical, um, a critical adjective, cost-effective. Because if it's not cost-effective, then um, you're going to have trouble implementing it or even getting industry to consider it. And then um, overall, where does the US industry and government rank in terms of physical protection of uranium? 
worldwide. And so now I'm hoping that Cindy will be able to put this in a broader context for us. So thanks for your attention. We'll shift over to Cindy. Sounds good. Thank you. I'll uh, tell you. Oh, no, I can come over here. <laughs> um, I will uh, give you more information about the project overall. It is, as Sharon said, an international project. In total, we are looking at 16, possibly 17. The 17th would maybe be Iran. Uh, we'll see how open uh, they will be. Uh, but there are some indications that might be the case. So the 16 countries in total, we are looking at seven of the nine possessors of nuclear weapons. The only two we are not capturing are North Korea uh, and Israel, and I think both for obvious reasons. Uh, and, uh, and then we're also looking at, it's a mix of producing and consuming countries of uranium. Uh, we also have four states within Africa, Malawi, Tanzania, uh, South Africa, and Namibia. We have Canada, Australia, Kazakhstan, uh, and who else am I missing? Brazil. So I think that makes 16 altogether. And we're looking at the safety security safeguards at the front end. Uh, how is it governed? And the reason why we're doing this is, is also because of, of after seven decades of mining uranium, we actually don't know um, how different states do and go about it. And as Sharon said, it's, it's not because we're looking at it because we view it as a high risk, as highly enriched uranium or, or plutonium, but in the sense that because we have uh, what are basically becoming shifting geographies of production and consumption. So what does this mean in this kind of shifting world? So for example, where the United States was the largest producer in 1979, today it's maybe the 10th, maybe even the 11th, because uh, in 2009, Malawi actually started producing. They are the most recent producer in 2009, and they actually became 10th by 2012. And, and so we're also seeing a lot more south-to-south -south trade. We also have a very thirsty uh, consumer, India, which is now also engaging in trade. And this is creating a lot of shifts for export control, uh, regulations, and policies that are in place for three decades. So how are these states able to grapple with these changes? And also, in terms of the NSG, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, about one-third of yellow cake trade is actually done outside of the NSG. So how does this work in practice as well? And, and then the difference is also between nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states. So we're trying to get a, a mapping and scoping of these major uh, new producers uh, coming up, the current ones, the old, more traditional ones, and then how this is actually having an impact. In terms of policy relevance, uh, if you are a newbie coming to the fuel cycle, in terms of my backyard, uh, Denmark and Greenland are currently on the path uh, to supplier status. Greenland is an island full of uranium, and it's all mixed in with its rare earth and gold and zinc and all the other things that they have. And so the question is, is that if you are a newbie, where do you go to get a sense of best practices? How do other states regulate? Uh, the IAEA can't really provide you these things. And I'll get into more in terms of the IAEA governance. Uh, then the IAEA is also having a, an internal discussion at the moment about at what point do safeguards get triggered or where should they be triggered at the very front end of the fuel cycle. At the moment, it's only the product of conversion. Uh, that basically has and historically also been where the IAEA in full scope accountancy comes in. And then provide recommendations for governing gap, governance gaps. Where do we see gaps? Some of them Sharon had just pointed out. Uh, where are there industry gaps uh, and so on and so forth. So in terms of the international picture, it's actually very limited. Uh, there's very limited governance for the very front end. So ore and ore residue is not under IAEA safeguards, meaning it's not under full material accountancy and control. So there is no IAEA inspectors to going around counting rocks, uh, obviously. Uh, but what there is is a reporting requirement of exports and imports. So as soon as a drum leaves your borders or enters your borders, of yellow cake, you need to report it to the IAEA. And when it comes to the additional protocol, however, and it says there, of course, if it's for nuclear purposes, and not if it's to a, non, a nuclear weapon state. Now, nuclear weapon states, uh, such as the United States, however, do have a voluntary reporting. So they have since 1979, I want to say. Um, four. Yeah, that would probably make sense, yeah. <laughs> um, 
that, uh, but it's a very interesting aspect, actually. Of course, these uh, rules and regulations were certainly heavily influenced by the nuclear weapon states, uh, and at that time, anything coming in uh, to their borders was not always necessarily what they wanted to report. Now, however, most of them do. The additional protocol came into play in 1997, and of course, this is a voluntary measure, and it's the only measure where the IAEA actually has the ability to get a fuller picture from the very front end to the very back end as to what's happening in the state. And in this case, it is actually, it's a reporting requirement still. You have to report how many mines you have, where they are, production capacity, how much you produced last year, how much is expected this year. And again, that's it. Uh, the additional protocol, however, does also have complementary access, or CAs. So they're not called inspections, they're called CAs. Uh, but the IAEA does go to mines under this protocol. So for example, Canada and Australia, they've each had about five visits. Uh, over the past few years. And also helped with a lot of ground truthing for the IAEA. Then there's the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, the CPPNM. And that has, it requires that physical protection of yellow cake is done. Uh, and that it it's done in a prudent management practice way. But it doesn't define what that means. So it's really up to interpretation and up to states to apply uh, those protections, whatever they think they may be. And of course, it doesn't apply to ore or residue, does it? but it does apply to UOC, uranium ore, concentrate, or commonly known as yellow cake. There is a 500 kilogram reporting requirement where uh, you are supposed to, in advance of anything over five, 500 kilos or more, you're supposed to provide that information to the state uh, where it's going, and, uh, and then of course they, they will do the same. Uh, this also comes from the NSG, the Nuclear Suppliers Group has the same requirement. And the CPPNM just basically takes that same requirement. Oh, sorry, let me just go back. So basically when you look at this picture, there's not much governance at the very front end. And when it comes to reporting, uh, if you're a major producer like Canada, Australia, you do report monthly to the IAEA. If you're very small, you might only do it annually. On the regional side, we get also a, a mix. So Euratom is different than the IAEA in that or is safeguarded. It is actually part of uh, the entire full accountancy system. Again, though, it is still much more a reporting requirement, but there is a material balance uh, accountancy that has to go with it. Physical inventory listings, advanced notifications, and that has been in place since 1957. Uh, Euratom safeguards are also applied at, for example, the UK uh, civil facilities, and that includes Springfields, the conversion facility there. And the UK is an interesting case because we actually have a very clear separation of civil and military programs at the conversion facility. This is not the case, uh, unfortunately, in, in all the different states that have conversion. At ABAC, the Argentine Brazilian Nuclear, was it Nuclear Accountancy and Control um, Organization, they, this is the agreement uh, between Argentina and Brazil. Uh, so that they have a method to actually look at each other's uh, programs. And their agreement, the, the Quad Agreement, uh, basically has the same reporting requirement as the IAEA. They have to report their imports and exports. ABAC, though, tells you uh, that we cannot verify this uh, because they don't have the additional protocol. So it is a reporting requirement, uh, and for ABAC, safeguards and verification basically begin at uranium dioxide level. And this is actually a new thing. The first inspection under that would have happened in January last year in Argentine. So let's keep in mind that these are intermediate results. Uh, we are about, oh, we've got another year of the project to go, but I think most of these are sensical uh, also uh, in terms of you need to have clear legislation, clear rules and regulations, and you'd be surprised, and I will take you through some cases, how that is not always the case. Uh, and inspection and enforcement, the need for actual people uh, in place who are trained to be able to carry out the inspections is not just a matter of having the rules and regulations on paper, but of course actually enacting them. Regular consultation with industry is highly critical and a very good best practice, uh, as are of course inventory and export controls. So even though the IAEA requires reporting on imports and exports, it becomes incumbent on states to actually have a system of inventory control so they know what it is that they're supposed to be reporting, how much is coming in and out, and then how are they actually allowing that uh, to leave their borders. A digitalized inventory database, this is something 
that is not common practice. Uh, in mining, it's based on ledgers. Uh, it's very old school. Uh, there is a movement, however, in different countries particularly. If you can imagine Canada, when it comes to its reporting to the IAEA, Canada is the second large, largest producer in the world. It actually gets uh, an email these days, before it used to be a fax, uh, from the different mining companies, well, from Cameco, uh, and they would tell them their inventory change documents every month, and then they would take that information, put it into a different system. Uh, so two database, uh, for example, full-time employees have to take that information today, put it into another system, and then send it to the IAEA. Now there is an attempt to try to merge that system so it can be digitalized and more real-time reporting. So I'm going to take you through three cases. Uh, I can answer questions. Uh, we've looked at about 10 so far in total, uh, so depending on what questions you may have. But Australia is basically considered or has a reputation globally for being the gold uranium standard. It's a very transparent system. Uh, it's quite simplistic. Uh, there are some other actors, but ASNO is the Australian Safeguards Non-Proliferation Office. It's nestled within the Department of Foreign Affairs. And they are responsible for safeguards, security, and also the bilateral nuclear cooperation agreements. And ASNO is it's a fascinating organization or agency in that it is not just uh, the one that reports to the IAEA and also works on issues to do with safeguards at the IAEA level, but it also has a security component that we don't always see in other countries. So they will approve security plans. The mine has to, by law, prepare a security plan that ASNO will approve, and those plans are good for five years. The mines uh, do them. Uh, usually they might subcontract someone out for them, but the mines do them, and then ASNO goes through and looks at it. Mining licenses, mining policy nationally is done by resources, uh, resources, economic and tourism, I believe it is. And I think now it's actually been changed names to uh, the Department of Industry. So they're the ones that actually look at the request for a mining license, and also for exports, they will make sure that whatever is coming through is actually based on a sales contract. Whereas ASNO then looks at the export control side to make sure that there's a bilateral agreement and what are the terms of that bilateral agreement. So there's a double look at it from two different perspectives. And then there's AMSA, the Australian Maritime Safety Association. And it is the competent authority for, well, shipping, uh, but also for packaging. So they will go in and inspect seals, make sure everything's in place, and look at the, uh, the way that the drums are, are packed. They will actually visit mines once a year. ASNO goes usually once a year as well. They actually go and inspect and look every single time. And on transport security, one of the things that I found very interesting about Australia, they have about 11,000 containers shipped a year. Never in this time has there been a major incident. And that's major. Um, and there's certainly a very high public sensitivity to yellow cake or uranium in general. You have to keep in mind that Australia exports all of its uranium. It does not use any of it. It all goes abroad. And there was a case where, uh, was it close to Ranger Mine, where a truck was uh, what they call bogged. It went into the ditch. It was, it was moving around a wide load to let it, go, let it go by. And it went in and it got ditched. And then the next day in the newspapers, it was uranium scare in Kakadu National Park. So I mean, there's a very high sensitivity, a lot of public, uh, what would you call it, oversight um, to keep things in check. And it's the same thing on the transport security side. Uh, the different states and territories do have full authority over their roads. Uh, but the mines do have to provide a transport plan. And the drivers are actually not allowed to deviate from that plan. Of course, they have detours if there's a tree on the road. Uh, but they're not allowed to deviate. Malawi is an interesting case. Uh, they started mining before legislation was in place. Obviously not best practice, uh, they know that, uh, they will tell you that, uh, and it's a very harsh lesson. If you start mining they, uh, before, they do have a mining act, uh, I can't remember when it was put in place, I want to say the 70s or 80s, uh, and then they finally put in a nuclear energy act in 2011. But for two years they were producing uh, before legislation in place, and it was a very 
perhaps naive uh, attempt in the beginning where they actually believed that industry would teach them how it would work. And that's not the way to do it. Industry uh, will not tell you that they love regulation, uh, obviously, but it has to be a clear system that they're working in. So there is long-term stability to be able to operate. And so there has to be something in place. The government is the one to provide oversight. And Malawi also didn't have the inspectors needed. There are some, obviously, cases where they were looking and doing the inspections before it would leave the borders. But it's not to the extent that we can see with others. Sorry, that's a misprint. It should say that by 2012, it became the 10th largest producer. So when it started in 2009, it produced 100 tons. By 2012, it was producing 1,000 tons. And surpassing, no, not surpassing the US. It's, uh, it's actually below that still. It uh, currently has all of its rules and regulations under review. Uh, as you can imagine, if you start mining before you have legislation in place, then you put in legislation, and then it kind of is not working. It's an extremely expensive process and laborious. And it will not create a very, this long-term stability that, that we crave to be able to operate and, and do the mining. Paladin suspended operations, actually, uh, February of this year. They claimed low spot price, and that's certainly uh, probably a huge part of that uh, equation for them. Uh, the mine has been losing money the whole four years that it's been uh, up and running so far. One of the things that's also interesting about, uh, about Malawi is that it does not have a bilateral agreement. So whereas Australia has, it has a requirement that every uh, shipment of UOC has to be part of a bilateral agreement. So they're not going to ship off to a country unless there's a nuclear cooperation agreement in place. Some countries, however, just use contract. So in the case of Malawi, it's just a matter of Palatin uh, with China. And all of the uranium from Malawi went to China. One of the other things about Malawi, which is uh, in terms of the region that it's in, so when the yellow cake leaves Malawi, it goes through Zambia, which is a transit country, and it has no nuclear legislation. Uh, in Malawi, they call it kind of a light touch approach. They will have a convoy that will go with it. As soon as it gets into Zambia, it's 60 trucks that will accompany it. So they call that the heavy approach. Then it goes in, in, into Namibia, where there is a uh, uranium mining, certainly, practice to the bay there to get shipped out. So there is a need for a much more regional harmonization from a light touch to heavy touch and, and really what are, what is the threat environment that they're working in? Do you need 60? Uh, do you need five? Uh, what is the, the, the system and then how are they going to be able to harmonize that better? And that's something that we've been hearing from Africa quite a bit, the need for a regional harmonization and transport. There is also a African debate if we're talking about the, the latest uh, consumer to enter the uranium trade, and that is India. And there's a big discussion right now about the Treaty Pelindaba, which makes Africa a nuclear weapons-free zone. The nuclear weapons-free zone basically says that you cannot trade with a state outside of the NPT. Simple. Uh, and because now you have Canada and Australia, these very you know, long-time leaders in the field of uranium production, a lot of these African countries are saying, well, why can't we? Why can't we trade with India? If these other countries are having bilateral agreements with them, why can't we? So there's a current debate about this. There's a possible, uh, there is a discussion about possibly amending the treaty. You all know how long amending treaties can take too, and they're not always that fun. Um, so this is actually something to watch because there is, there is rumblings. And a lot of the, the politicians are trying to figure out again, why can we not engage? How has this treaty, and why is it stopping us from doing so? But again, it also starts because it was, took what, three, four decades for this treaty to actually come into force. This is China. Um, this report was done by Tamara Patton, who did an absolutely brilliant job at sleuthing through the myriad of regulations and state-owned enterprises and everything that you see up there. Uh, it is quite fantastic. And China, from what she concluded was is that it's kind of been in a perpetual sense of, of updating all of its regulations. And this perpetual sense, though, has created this web. And these aren't the regulations, these are just the agencies. Um, but if you look in the report, I do have copies of it. And if you did not get one, just give me your business card. I'll make sure you get it. It's also online on our website uh, at dis, uh, www.dis.dk. And so this web basically has kind of evolved over time. I and mean, a lot of regulations are contradictory. Some of them overlap. 
some of the different departments uh, have their own rules and regulations that also might be contradictory. The legislation is unclear in terms of definitions. It does yellow cake apply? What is yellow cake? Uh, even, and so it, it becomes very much a challenge if you are shipping to China. Who are you shipping to? But at least it's good to know these two, uh, the China Nuclear Energy Industry Corporation and the Nuclear Fuel Company are the only two entities in China that are allowed to purchase or import export uranium. CNNC, the China National Nuclear Corporation, is the nuclear body, uh, and it has a dual role. And uh, that's one of the important things about this. Again, China is a nuclear weapon state, and its dual uh, civil military uh, structure has always been there, and it's also uh, perpetual. And CNNC um, has kind of been not split. I mean, it's what well over 100,000 employees. It's a massive organization. Uh, but in order for, where is the CAEA? There it is. The China Atomic Energy Authority is actually part of CNNNC, uh, as you can see kind of up how they're connected. And it is the one that actually relates to the IAEA. They're the ones that talk to them. But you do have employees that are employed by CAEA and CNNNC. It's the same guy. They might have two different cards. Uh, so this is a system that is quite difficult, uh, obviously, to understand. And the, the end result is, is that it's actually very hard for us in the, in, the, in the project to know really how implementation of the rules and regulations that China has laid out, how they work. And that's one of the challenges, uh, particularly since it is quite opaque. And then just some gaps, to highlight some gaps. Uh, there is obviously differences between nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states, just by the virtue of how much of the fuel cycle that they have. We do notice differences in public sensitivities. So there's a higher sensitivity in Australia to yellow cake than there is here, uh, and even in Canada. Canada has uh, almost the whole fuel cycle, except for enrichment. Um, and this also includes you know, differences in inventory control, how they uh, track everything, and their export controls and inspection regimes. I think one of the interesting things is accounting for losses. This is a gap. The IAEA says that you have, um, it would be best practice if a drum was missing to find it within a year. That's a long time. Nuclear security uh, premise, however, and the IAEA's current uh, approach to looking at nuclear security for the Iranian industry, says one month would be prudent practice. And, but we have kind of an interesting dynamic when it comes to the legislation. So in this country, the NRC uh, has a 15 pound figure. So if you lose 15 pounds, and it's more from a kind of a safety perspective where you lose it in process or whatever, uh, that you have to report that or 150 pounds a year. They've never had, it's a self-reporting requirement. They've never had any, uh, any such reporting ever come in. And in part, you can slightly understand why, because 15 pounds, is they lose that on a daily basis. 15 pounds is nothing. And you can imagine the paperwork <laughs> to go through for 15 pounds. And the NRC also will tell you it's mostly from a safety perspective and it is from, from a security perspective, as Sharon also highlighted in, in, her, in her slides. Canada has a policy where you have to account for everything, and Australia is every gram has to be accounted for. But again, these are self-reporting, and it's almost impossible to be able to legislate that in the way, at least the way that they do. Uh, so this is one of the challenges in Canada, for example, doesn't even have a line item for theft. Granted, they might, they've done threat assessments that say, okay, we, uh, in the northern part of Saskatchewan, we feel that the yellow cake is secure, uh, but should there not be that line item? What if it does happen? Bottlenecks at conversion facilities is another big issue. So, for example, when Converdine has been shut down, it just reopened, what, January, February this year? Yeah. Um, it was shut down for over two years. And it was still business as usual in terms of all of its imports. So everything is coming in. It's, it can be stacked to the, to the skies. Uh, and then what does that mean for inventory control? Because it actually does not get registered in the system. I mean, it, obviously, when it goes through the gate, there is an invoice back and forth. But then in terms of when it gets actually dumped into the facility, it can be years. So you can have a drum sitting out there for years. Uh, we do have cases of theft. We have cases of diversion. Uh, Sharon highlighted one from 1978. 
And we actually have cases of far more recent. We have, uh, if you remember even last year, there was the, the guy from Africa who was caught with yellow cake in his heels uh, at New York, uh, at JFK. Uh, then in November last year, when I was in Cape Town, uh, there was a guy who was, uh, had one, it was about one kilo in a plastic bag. And for both of these cases, there were thoughts that this was kind of samples of something bigger. This is what I've got, I can get you a whole lot more. Uh, we have a case in Namibia which is similar to, to the Sohio experience where it was actually a sting, it was created by uh, the Namibian police. Oh, sorry Sharon, I think I might have stepped on something. <laughs> um, and so they had tried to see actually how secure the mine was. And so they basically created a market. They wanted to know out there, we want to buy a thousand tons, let's say. And they found the same thing. There were employees, inside employees, who actually used a gap in inventory control in the waste part. So drums that were damaged, or drums that were half full, or considered waste, were not inventoried, the same way as everything else was. So it was moved out. The police caught it. Um, so these are some cases. There's obviously a whole lot more. Uh, and that, I think, is an interesting part, because when you do talk to many people, industry, government-wise, that is not really part of the discussion. And I think it should be in that we do have these cases. There, and depending on the threat environment, or the, particularly if you're in a heightened security environment, what that means for you, particularly if you're a newbie to the fuel cycle. Uh, obviously, kind of highlight again the need for harmonization, uh, particularly on the transport side. There is the safety versus security. Some do the two-sided of one coin aspect, some separate them. Uh, it is important to have both sets whether they're complementary or not, it is important in terms of best practice, but we don't see that all over the place. And then a need for a better military civilian separation. After seven decades of mining uranium, I am actually surprised that the civilian side in nuclear weapon states is not more separate. And in fact, it should be demanded by the non-nuclear weapon states, particularly these days. Uh, your conversion facilities are all dual use. China, all three dual use. Russia, dual use. Here, dual use. Only ones that are not are Canada. And there are only six countries in the world where you can convert your commercial uranium. And that is the five NPT nuclear weapon states in Canada. So again, if you're a newbie and you're like Denmark or Greenland and you want to be able to somehow inspire confidence to your public that your uranium is actually going for civilian purposes, how do you do that when everything goes to dual use facilities? So that's one of the other uh, main challenges. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Um, I will open the floor for questions. And while you're gathering your thoughts, let me ask an easy question. Oh, good. Status update. What is the IEA doing? And I think you were part of an experts group on this. So if you can just update us on that. Uh, there was a consultancy on this uranium security, sorry, nuclear security for the uranium industry. Uh, and it has drafted a tech doc, uh, which will be put forward to the Nuclear Security Guidance Committee, the IAEA NSGC as it's called, uh, in June. So it will go through uh, the internal process once the NSGC, if they approve it, then it goes into, I believe it's 140 days or something like that, a uh, review period for states to comment. So if they, all things go well and smooth, then it should be published uh, next year. And it is a, it bases everything on a graded approach. It doesn't say that, look, yellow cake everywhere in the world should have five guards or anything like that. It's very much based on uh, threat assessments, security environments, and also changes in those uh, assessments and threat environments. And again, it's more for the newbies. If you are coming in, how much do you need to protect this stuff? And particularly if it's the only nuclear material in your country, how do you go about it? It's not recommendations, it's just a sort of updating No, it is step. recommendations. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'll have a table uh, of different scenarios in, in a way uh, highlighting um, at what point, for example, or how much you need to protect that, not really. Um, the, the report basically says up until the point of precipitation, there is a sense that and an understanding that basic common industrial practice will protect that part. It's when it becomes drummable 
uh, when it puts into a drum and movable, that that's where you have more of a security risk. Mm -hmm. And is the, this experts group, is it mostly focused on just security or yes. are they looking at a holistic? Just security. Okay. I believe there is a safety uh, one as well now, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know the status of that. So will they actually handle this as they handled other areas with a kind of, you know, whatever tech docs, you know, recommended sort of right. feel free to ignore? Well, hopefully of, not, no. but yeah. <laughs> All right. I mean, I, yeah. I would be curious to see if I pass missions mm. then, which are the physical protection advisory services, um, whether they would take those recommendations into account and include that in their IPASSes? The, the idea also is for the IAEA, they, they did a, a pilot training uh, last year in Africa. And, uh, and this is also something that they can provide. So uh, there is the training of the tech doc that is available to states, which is very useful. Hmm. Questions from the audience? Yes, no. Yes, I'm Milton Honig. Uh, the IEA is perhaps now visiting uh, a Iranian mine and mill or, uh, at uh, Sagan and, and Artakan. Uh, what, is, what can they be expected to find? Uh, what is the significance of that, if, if any? What, sorry, is the... What is the significance of this visit, except just for the IEA to exercise a visit? Um, is part of some kind of confidence building measure. But I mean, can they really find anything? What are they looking for? Sure. You want to take a bunch of questions or should we do them each? No. Um, well, I'm, and a range of issues. It, it's, uh, you're talking about the in situ mines, I'm assuming. Um, I don't know if there's any, yeah. But they, they because they don't go to count drums uh, at the mills and like that, it's, uh, and, and depending on the large, you know, the producer that you're talking to, of course, they kind of balk at the idea of counting thousands and thousands of drums. Uh, but they go and, and they, for various reasons, obviously there, there is a need for ground truthing, so to get an understanding, it is a learning uh, exercise, of course, it's not just a matter of exercising that, right, but it's also a matter of, of learning more about, particularly from the ground truthing side. Uh, and this is the same thing that happens when they're in Australia and Canada. They, they do learn a lot of information, particularly when they're looking at countries of proliferation concern. So they can use that information to understand production levels, uh, how many people it takes, for example, what does it mean by so many people in a mine. And then understanding the, they do, they will go in and, and look at, not inspect uh, per se, but they will go in and look at the various, the, the packaging area, for example, and, and how things are, are working. Uh, but it's not like they'll issue a violation, for example. I was just going to add that given that right now the talks on Iran are, are really focused on trying to define an acceptable level of enrichment in some kind of final agreement if they're able to get to one, that it would be very important for the IAEA to understand what their plans, production plans are and how much they could actually produce in the, in the next 10 years. And the IAEA went to the mine, uh, went to one of the mines in yeah. January. Yeah, and I think they're going to a couple more yeah. this week or something. I that, that most of their uranium comes from, um, I think, a shipment from South Africa. When the Shoah was still there, the, the, the uranium mine, two uranium mines in Iran do not produce very much. No. And, and I no. don't think uh, Iran should be counting on them. Okay. Uh, so thank, thank you both. The nice, very nice presentations, very interesting as always. Um, I had a question which isn't maybe quite as relevant to the security aspects, but I want to, given that you've started to look at uranium mining and the transportation and processing, uh, one of the biggest concerns uh, around uranium mining, of course, is how dirty it is. I mean, it's one of the, I don't know how many people have actually ex looked at extractive industries in all around the world, but. We, meaning Green Cross, has, <clears throat> has done some work in that regard, and it, it really is astounding to me how dirty and environmentally uh, dangerous uh, uranium mining uh, is all, all over the world where it happens. And I wondered if you had any insight into environmental impact, public health impact, worker safety, uh, which does to some extent, of course, overlap security issues, but not, I, I assume it's not 
a uh, main goal of this uh, report and study? Yeah, no, we, I mean, none of us are environmental scientists on the, on the project. We're, we're all non-proliferation ones. Uh, so we are coming at it from that perspective. Now, of course, when we're going in and we're looking at the, how a state, what all the rules and regulations are that govern, uh, and particularly since there is usually an overlap on safety security, obviously we do get a sense of the environmental, occupational health and safety issues, uh, tailings issues, for example. Uh, and we do hear cases where, you know, like, for example, if we're talking about Converdine, that was shut down because of safety issues. Um, and so we have the same thing happening at, at different mines, obviously, as well, where there, there will be infractions and there are inspections. Uh, but I mean, let me, let me give you, for example, um, some things or some trends that, that we do see. Um, one of the things I found interesting with Australia is that now they are putting together a national dose, radiation dose system or tracking system. So whereas before, if you worked at one mine and if you left and went to another mine, you would start fresh at the new mine. Whereas now, anytime if you're a, uh, a miner and you're moving to different mines, your whole lifetime radiation dosage will be tracked. And I think that is a, a wonderful example uh, of actually, well, one, studying it more uh, and keeping better track uh, from an occupational health and safety side. Um, I can tell you also, I mean, you know, when I was in Canada, it's the, the safety at these mines um, it seems, again, I don't, I'm not an occupational health and safety person, but there are many layers uh, that are in place. On the environmental side, uh, you know, when you, particularly when you look at the legacy sites, it's embarrassing, it's shameful. Um, it's uh, granted, you know, at the same time, a lot of these mines were initially established when we, the world did not think of the environment or pollution or, or what that meant. And some countries have done incredible jobs, like this one actually, on remediating. Uh, a lot of the mines. And I think one of the things that, for when I was starting out, I actually never would have imagined that I would be saying that the US, and when it comes to its legacy sites, has done a very good job. Um, industry in Australia is embarrassed by how it's going in Australia. Uh, and they'll tell you that. So there, it, it's, it's a scar, uh, the legacy mines. There, there is no doubt about that. And I think there has been a lot of lessons learned from them um, and, and how to carry that forward. But again, there's a lot of environmental scientists out there working on that, so we'll just try to focus on the non-proliferation side. I, I would just add um, that we give some specific examples in our report of the different um, you know, regulations or restrictions that came from safety that have security benefits. But you're, you're, what your question sparks in me is this idea that some of these new producers, right, they may not have good governance systems across the board, right? So one of the ways, and maybe I'm really naive or idealistic, call it what you will, um, but if you get the environmental safety hook, you can get civil society more interested in that governance portion with your collateral security benefits. I think for, I would say overall, for, for newcomers, um, the idea that you could approach this across the board holistically rather than piecemeal, right? You know, I mean, again, it's a question of don't do it the way we did it. <laughs> you know, do it a lot smarter. Mm. Get that cell phone instead of your landlines <laughs> first, right? Skip, skip a generation. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the landmark legislation in the U.S., it was because of environmental health and safety. It was not because of anything else, really. And we just happened to reap some benefits of, along yeah, I would, the way. I would just comment that I, I do think you're absolutely right, Sharon, that, that safety and security go sort of hand in hand. And if you, you can't really have one without the other in some ways. Uh, and I think it, if you're not worried about uh, safety issues, which includes environment and public health, and worker issues, occupational worker issues, um, really oftentimes can't convince you know, companies or industry or governments to follow up with security improvements as well. So, and I do think this is an industry, but it's, it's, it's probably worse than most extractive industries in the world, but um, it's also in some ways similar. Uh, there's a, a lot of need in trying to figure out what to do with uranium tailings, and of course all of this increases costs enormously mm -hmm. as well. And so for new, new, less developed countries to get into these industries, um, there's some resistance because the cost, of course, becomes much higher. Uh, but we have the same issue with, of course, nuclear power and, you know, spent fuel management and all that sort of, the whole fuel cycle as well. 
So a lot of these questions come up on the same, the whole panoply, I think, of uh, birth to death or birth to birth of uh, nuclear materials management. And the title of the report, you know, Governing Uranium, in my mind, points towards best business practices, right, which should put highest of all protection of public health and the environment. Hi, I'm Melissa Mann with Urenco, uh, the uranium enrichment company, and what's notable is what we're talking about uh, is the stuff that eventually comes to our enrichment plants. Um, so we're, we're obviously very interested in what happens at the very beginning, the, the, uh, the very early part of the nuclear fuel cycle. But uh, Cindy and Sharon, I just wanted to offer you some observations from that vantage Please. point. Uh, first of all, I'd note that this week the spot uranium price fell below $30 for the first time in a very long time, and that continues uh, a steady downward trend post Fukushima. And what, what that means is that a lot of those aspirational mining projects are absolutely not viable, right, mm -hmm. per pound, right? Yeah, it's about a little over $29 a pound right now. So a lot of the entrants that we thought we were going to have into the nuclear fuel cycle are not coming. And even those big miners, uh, perhaps with the exception of Kazakhstan, are cutting back their own programs. That partly speaks to the fact that there are phenomenal inventories of nuclear fuel in the market right now. And again, that's really a function of Fukushima. The 52 Japanese reactors are no longer taking uranium conversion or enrichment services. Uh, and the fact that we've had a number of reactors shut down over the past several years, including several in the U.S. What that means is that you have a not insignificant amount of uranium coming to utilities, not through the traditional mining source, but from secondary inventory supply. And so I just, I don't want you to lose sight of that because the numbers are significant and what you may find is that in, that shifts your analysis of where these controls come into play. Uh, as one example, I can tell you that we have an excess of enrichment in the market. And so what companies like mine are doing is turning over uh, our capacity. Instead of producing low enriched UF6, we're producing natural UF6 mm -hmm. and are, in fact, displacing some. Um, I don't think we have any miners here to throw things at me, but displacing some of that primary production. Uh, at Urenco, we have uh, turned just shy of 15% of our total worldwide capacity to natural UF6 production. 15% of global. No, this is. Um, correct. That's right. So instead of producing, uh, we do it both through tails re enrichment um, or through the difference in our operational and contractual essays through underfeeding the operation. Uh, about a year and a half. But what that means is you, again, you get this vast disparate um, difference where you might have all of the controls at an enrichment site that you're used to seeing, you know, from that secondary production versus, uh, you know, this variance at primary producing. Can I ask Melissa another question? Do, do you expect to increase that from 15% the amount of capacity? I mean, could you see yourself increasing that? Uh, I don't. But speaking for Urenco only, no, I don't because, you know, an enrichment plant is optimized to produce less than 5% enrichment, um, but certainly above 0.711% you know, enrichment. So the farther uh, we get off of that optimum, uh, the less cost effective it becomes. And unless the uranium price goes up dramatically, and I don't see really any good reasons for that to happen, no, we're, we're probably where we're going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Hugh Haskell, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Uh, can we go back to the mines themselves for a moment and talk about the safety and security there? Uh, and I'm particularly concerned about public safety in, in mines, especially those that are located where other people are around. And I'm sure there are lots of them, at least among the, those in the United States. What is being done to protect the tailings from being visited 
either inadvertently or ignorantly by local people who don't understand what's in those tailings piles. Well, I mean, again, we, you know, didn't really look, s well, I shouldn't say that from a security perspective, obviously we're looking at that. It, it depends on the uh, location of the mine. So in northern Saskatchewan, for example, there are no fences um, around these mines. There's also no people. Uh, the, the people fly in, fly out, um, and, and that's actually more and more a practice that happens, the flying in, flying out. Uh, because they are in, in usually extremely remote uh, areas. And also some countries, for example, have uh, rules or laws where you can't fence in wilderness areas. Um, in Australia, at Kakadu National Park, there is, however, a fence and there's a gate. Uh, and it is you know, a mine that is within the national park. Uh, but it will say, it's very clearly stated that it is separate from, it's located in but separate from uh, Kakadu National Park. Uh, and when I went up uh, to northern Saskatchewan uh, and looked at uh, some of the old, older mines, uh, they're extremely proud of their tailing uh, ponds. Um, and it's, uh, it's very interesting and of course a lot of the stuff that they're talking about on the environmental side I can't grasp. Um, but in terms of the security side, there wasn't any kind of threat assessments in, in those types of areas where, and they had, nor had they had any cases where people would go in and, uh, or outsiders would actually infiltrate a tailing spot. There could be some issues with newbies. Uh, and that's where we could get into a safety security aspect. Most of these though are still in remote areas. If I'm thinking about Greenland, for example, uh, any production there would, would, would take a long time, particularly with such a low spot price. Uh, but there it's rare earth uh, that is the primary target. Uh, and there, as I understand it, there is uh, rules on not allowing fences, but because, particularly in the area of Kalanafeld, I think we could suspect that there would be a fence, at least around packing areas and at least around probably the tailings, uh, so that elk and caribou don't wander in and uh, uh, and all these other kinds of aspects. But it really depends from, from state to state and where the mines are. Sydney, did you notice any differences um, in primary miners when it was uh, intentionally a uranium mine versus uranium being a byproduct of some other mining activity? Yeah, big time. Uh, and this is actually where we see a lot of uneven reporting for the IAEA. So a lot of states will think, well, I'm shipping off gold or the mine is about gold, so whatever this uranium we're shipping off as well, we don't need to report it because it's a byproduct. And we do make the point uh, again and again that if you are mining uranium, you are mining uranium. It doesn't matter whether it's a byproduct or not. It still triggers all these rules and regulations internationally at least, uh, and usually nationally as well. It's considered a strategic resource across so many states. Uh, so that's uh, disconcerting, um, this, this sense that somehow because it's a byproduct it can't be diverted. Uh, or, or it couldn't be misused. Uh, we also have the secondary, the phosphate uh, issue where uh, the, the technology to suck uranium from phosphates is very wild, wide known. Um, and I think we talk about, was it 20,000 tons of phosphates or uranium from phosphates since, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago? Um, so this is also one that is not reported uh, by a lot of different states. We have one case where I think it was 2006 where two Finnish companies, it was a small amount, they reported uh, receiving one ton of yellow cake from Congo and Congo did not report uh, that one ton. Uh, so the IAEA though is also, and this is one of the challenges and which would be nice, we always talk about of course the IAEA is challenged by its uh, lack of resources, uh, financial uh, particularly. Uh, but uh, the transit matching uh, on the 34AB, in CERC 134AB paragraphs of the imports and exports could probably be better. Uh, but again, they also need the resources to be able to do that. And without the states doing the reporting, and how do you go in and verify that? I have to ask a question. How are they doing? You said it could be better, but... I, I, I think it could be, um, and, and I think it's... Is it computerized? Is it... Oh, that's, <laughs> a, that's a good question. I'll ask. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that, I, I mean, well, they, they have to take all the information that comes in, but uh, the IAEA could do a much better job in actually doing outreach about what 34 A and B mean. 
uh, and, and that is not being done. Uh, and, and so they're, particularly to the newbies, of, of anything, phosphates, we should go. Uh, and we should explain to them that, uh, that there, there is this 34AB requirement. And also particularly for the newbies where um, they just don't know these requirements. They're very non-nuclear, and this is the other thing with most newbies, extremely non-nuclear. Uh, most of them have no nuclear legislation at all. So even Denmark, Greenland, for example, Denmark is part of Eurotom, but Greenland does not. Still, just by the fact that they could become this producer, they need a whole new export control system, they need inventory control systems, they need, and, and the, to be able to understand what the rules and regulations are. So they, of course, are asking the IAEA to come and explain all these things to them so they know what the requirements are and that they can fulfill them. Uh, and this is actually a really good point you raised too because politicians, unfortunately, really do not understand the term byproduct uh, and that it really is just an economic term. So as long as the, it is the, the lower earning part of the, of the deposit, uh, then you can call it a byproduct. But as soon as that spot price jumps up like it did in 2007, it'll be the primary. Well, yeah, so I mean, this, this point means that a reliance, especially the low price of uranium, means that a reliance on the industry's economic reasons for doing accounting is misplaced or could be, wouldn't, wouldn't work as well. Could be. In the, for, for, you know, so if Greenland is gonna mine, they're gonna be looking at their gold and their rare earths and all the rest of it and could very well ignore uranium for well, they a won't. while. Um, but <laughs> they won't because you're gonna, you're <laughs> exactly, won't let them. I won't let them, but, but there's also uh, another good point that you raised, Melissa, which is one of, the, one of the debates within Greenland and Denmark is because the uranium in, in Kvanefeld is mixed in with the, with the rare earth in a very unique way, uh, it requires a new milling or separation technology. And of course it's technology, but they still need to figure out what that is going to be. Then the, there is the kind of, well, maybe we'll just make some kind of mineral concentrate, right? So we'll have the rare earths, we'll have the, the uranium, and it's not a high level, it's about 200 parts per million. Uh, thorium is 800 parts per million. Uh, and then they have some zinc. But once it's put into this mineral concentrate, then the uranium goes up to, to 2,000 parts per million. But it's not considered source material under the IAEA, but it is captured uh, under additional protocol. So it would still be reported. And that is something that states just don't know. Stephanie, you had a question. I had a couple questions uh, for Cindy, and maybe Sharon has some knowledge of this too. But um, I've, there's an effort by, I guess, the NNSA and Ornell, the Oak Ridge, to, and I think it's been going on for a number of years, to do some kind of uniform barcoding on UF6 cylinders. And apparently now they've got buy-in from industry. I don't know how long that's been either. Um, <clears throat> and I wonder, A, if that has IAEA involvement or if you're involved, you know, if you, you know, how that sort of might segue into what you're doing. And also kind of what is your input with the IAEA on their own uranium governance project? that you just described earlier. Is the consultancy you mean? Or? The, yeah, this, um, this thing that they, you say they're gonna come out with a report next mm. year. The tech doc. The tech doc, yeah. And sorry, what is the question exactly about the tech doc? Well, I wondered how much input you're having. I mean, since oh, you're doing okay. this project, you'd think they'd want your input, so. Right, <laughs> okay, um, Well, first, I'll, I'll work backwards. Um, I participated on the consultancy, and to be honest, when I first got there, it was, it was it, learning, learning, learning. Um, this project has been, an incredible learning experience. Uh, and the, the, the results, when we get them in, uh, each of the reports, we, we share it all with the IAEA, same thing as we do with Greenland and Denmark, for example. Uh, so as, and, as and, and I ask questions. So whenever I'm stumped or I don't get something or how, what is the, uh, the, the technical language or the legal language, whatever, I ask them and they're extremely responsive. Uh, so there's a very good working relationship there and, and, and they're, certainly uh, interested in, in everything that's coming out of here. And what it will mean for them, I don't know. Um, that I think will remain to be seen, but also most of the states that we're, we're doing these reports on are very interested uh, in what comes out of them. Barcoding. Melissa, you might have a little bit more to talk about, actually. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the... Uh, well, Orenco. in fact, it was just last week that DOE hosted an international meeting here in town on that initiative. 
Uh, there was some industry participation, although it was actually fairly limited. Um, there was definitely IAEA awareness of that meeting. I think one of the, the speakers, uh, although ex-IAEA was Ali, yeah. Um, and I would say there's industry buy-in. Um, it's not even. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the one common denominator was an agreement that the very first thing you need to have is a uniform serial numbering system. Uh, because one of the things we found in UF6 cylinders, and it would be both for natural and enriched UF6, is that the serial numbering methodology is uh, just it's all over the map. Some people say, you know, I named it for my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Some people call it one thing when it's at one plant. It has a different number when it goes to a different facility. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to come up with a uniform system so that what I call the cylinder on my side is the same thing that somebody else calls it. Mm -hmm. And then you can figure out when it comes and goes. The second part of that is whether you actually have a, a satellite tracking mechanism. And I'll say that remains, um, remains unresolved, partly because there's a regulatory component, uh, there's a performance component. You know, what we do with UF6 cylinders is put them in a hot box, uh, and the tracking mechanisms don't survive that environment. Um, two, what's the right tracking methodology, uh -huh. and how is that used? Mm -hmm. uh, where we simply just heat the UF6 um, to take it from its solid to its gaseous form. Uh -huh. And it doesn't survive, like it wouldn't survive satellite tracking. Well, it, it, it doesn't survive at all. The, the piece just disintegrates. <laughs> right. This so, is, yeah. So this is if you have an individual tracking device on a cylinder itself. Okay. I see. Okay. Once it's been enriched, it's, that dissolves. I, I mean, the, the problem is those devices don't necessarily survive either the transport environment or the operating plant environment, nor are they a licensed part of the cylinder from a cylinder performance standard. I see. Okay. But I, I am not aware that there was any conversation about extending that backwards to concentrate packaging. Right. There, there has been some. Uh, there has, there has been some discussion about it. It's not well received. <laughs> Uh, but I think I think it's a good part of the. I mean, this discussion needs to happen where we do track soap better uh, in many regards. Um, you know, uh, my business cards were, were you know more trackable in that way. Um, and and of course, you you can make the argument that look, but you can you know from a security perspective, uh, you can make up a dummy lot, right? Uh, you can make your own scanners and, and all these other things. But of course, everything that you can do to further add these layers of of, of um, uh, not detecting, what's the yeah. opposite? No, um, deterring, thank you. <laughs> deterring uh, such cases, of course. I mean, it's, it's one element, and it would be exactly the same thing as Melissa. That would be one way to have this, if you can get the uniform methodology, then at least you know where that drum is, and it's just a matter of hitting it. You, you can find it where it's gonna be, you know, if it's hanging out at a, at a conversion facility for years, or, I mean, at least there'll be a computerized, not just ledger system. Uh, one of the things I think, I, I saw a picture of a, a UF6 drum, and it had like seven, eight different, uh, and then there, and I saw, you know, there, there's been a couple of proposals, well, we'll just take on another. Um, and, and so it, I, it must be confusing. Um, and, and so again, I mean, we've been doing this trade for so long, there should be a much better system. Again, we have a much better system for soap. I was going to say, wouldn't the system, at least forgetting for a minute the tracking devices that dissolve and the satellites, if you just had serial, a serial number, a uniform serial number, wouldn't it also make it life a little easier for just for record keeping for the converters and the enrichers? I mean, I can't speak for a you know, we, What we receive is the natural UF6, and those packages do have distinct serial numbers. On the concentrate side, you've got to remember they're shipping them primarily in 55-gallon drums that are a one-off use before they might be scrapped. Mm -hmm. So, But they have uniform serial numbers not always. on a converter. At a converter, yes. Are, would this tracking system that they're talking about be for um, enriched UF6 only or for the stuff that's coming into the enrichment plant as well as going out? Both, both natural and low okay. enriched UF6. And is there, is this, is there involvement of Tenex and, and like um, um, Arriva, for example, in this? Uh, I was not at the meeting last week. I know that Cameco was in attendance. Uh -huh. uh, certainly Urenko was. I'm not aware that uh, the French or the Russians were present. But that may just be my ignorance. Mm -hmm. so, so is there any 
country that uses barcoding now on these drugs? Not that we're aware of. So that could be an important, Along if, with a digitalized, if not barcoding, yeah. but at least uniform serial numbering systems, an important recommendation in this. IEA and it would help with inventory up. control, providing your reporting requirements for the IAEA. Yeah. Are there other questions or comments from the audience? Yes. <laughs> the risk of talking too much. We're going to have you up here next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, just one of the other observations I was going to make, you talked about the differences, Cindy, in, in different countries. Um, and when I think about the uranium that comes into our plants for processing, uh, we do, in fact, treat certain origin uranium very differently. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the obligations that are imposed on it. So the tracking that we have on house, and we do, we do track all origins and obligations, but the burden on us to do something extra is particularly um, significant for Canadian and Australian material because they have obligations into perpetuity. And so anytime we move that material off our site, we do have another obligation to our national regulator and there's a, you know, a handshake between countries under the 123 agreements. Do you, do you provide that uh, into an electronic system? Does that go into NIMIS then or does that, is it just an email? Uh, well, it goes into certainly an internal electronic okay. system that we have, which is quite robust, um, and we do track that from a NIMIS standpoint uh, for our U.S. operation. Uh, under our European operations, that's done uh, with Euratom. Yeah, and, that, and that's a good point and something that I, that I didn't actually raise. I, sh I should remember that to put it into this. Uh, is that there are states, obviously, that do these obligations, and Canada, Australia do have the highest uh, conditions of supply tacked on with their, with their uranium. Um, Euratom um, also usually has some kind of uh, conditions of supply uh, and then the U.S. also has obligations when it sends its uh, material away. So we do have kind of uh, obligated material going around through, through the world and it's based on these one, two, three agreements. But if you're only going through contracts and of course uh, then that's not the case. In spite of those obligations though, I mean my impression was that material at the converter is kind of infinitely fungible. Is that true or false? It's infinitely physically fungible from an accounting sense, not at all. Um, and I'll speak more to the U.S. experience because there is a little bit more of a robust system because we do have to report that to the NRC in many cases. Uh, you know, one of the things to remember is the fuel cycle is, is incredibly international and so something, you know, you might have uh, several shipments of ore coming into a conversion facility. They're often going from that conversion facility to some other location, often out of the country. They would need uh, an NRC export license. Um, and the NRC requires you to report those origins, primarily for the purpose of determining if you have Canadian or Australian, but you also need to tell them what the balance is. Um, and then uh, in the U.S., something uh, that seems unrelated is the Sarbanes-Oxley controls. So utilities that own these valuable commodities want to know exactly where they are, and they often account for them not just by volume and value, but also by origin. Yes, Paul. Last question. Okay, thanks. Um, once again, Paul Walker with Green Cross International. Um, I keep thinking of the Oklahoma City bombing or many of the other, you know, improvised explosive bombings we, device bombings we have all over the world all the time these days. And you said, Sharon, that 5,000 pounds, two and a half tons were, were, you know, diverted in 1979. And I'm wondering what if, what if, um, you know, an Oklahoma City bombing took place with, say, half a ton or a ton of yellow cake? Uh, it, it was the same size bomb, which is enormous, as we know. Um, and uh, yet distributed measurable radioactivity. Uh, wouldn't be a nuclear explosive device, obviously, but would, would, would obviously spread measurable radioactivity all over Oklahoma City. Well, it would be toxic, not necessarily radioactive. Yeah, well, toxic then. Yeah. yeah, how much of a difference would that make? And I'm thinking, how would a terrorist group use a ton of yellow cake? How or they, would they necessarily... Well, they'd have to be able to lift it, for one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, the Oklahoma yeah. City bombing was a big truck. Mm. And we know of test cases where, you know, big rental trucks have been left outside of, for example, nuclear power plants uh, just to test whether anyone would raise a question about it being parked there for 24 hours. So say you brought in an 18-wheeler 
mm -hmm. okay, with a large explosive device, fertilizer and gasoline bomb or something, and you put a ton of, yellow say, cake. yellow cake into it, what difference would that make with or, with, with or without the yellow cake from a sort of socioeconomic and destruction perspective? I, it's much more of a, uh, a a PR, uh, you know, it's a, it's a psychological uh, terror aspect. Uh, it's kind of like the, the bogged truck, uh, uranium scare in Cac it, it, There was no scare. Um, the truck just got its wheel stuck. Um, so it, it, it is certainly public um, perception and sensitivities. When we talk about a spill um, in any country, actually, when we talk about a yellow cake spill, uh, then it is treated as a toxic it's not, con it's not considered radioactive. Yeah, it's a chemical. Um, mm -hmm. So your, yes. your emergency response would be, would be based on that, yeah. I mean, remember that uranium-238 has a half-life of 700 million years. <laughs> that is pretty long. So as you say, it's the toxic metal effects, it's a psychological impact, mm -hmm. and it's the um, uh, contamination of, the cost of the contamination of the area uh, more than the radioactivity. Yeah. yeah. And I think the only, sorry, the only place that I've actually seen major, uh, you know, the actual kind of hazmat suits is in Canada, uh, in, in the mines, but there they also have 20, 25% uh, uranium grade, so it's a little bit different there. I, I would say that the bottom line is it would be worse. However, if I were um, that kind of person looking to make a dirty bomb, uh, I would think you could find a, a much more highly radioactive, like a medical radioisotope, you know, walk into a hospital, grab some cobalt-60 or something. Um, and it's much, you know, security is maybe about the same um, and w with a higher impact. But you're right, it would, um, you know. So, so the, the issue is what we tried to show, at least in the U.S., you've got to get lots of this material. Uh, and once you're getting lots of the material, you know, the, the cost benefit, the difficulty of diversion or moving it or whatever um, increases. But I want to thank all of you for coming today. Thanks for your terrific questions and your comments. And especially thanks to Cindy for thank coming you for from so far away. Thanks.